Who'd be an F1 stand-in driver? It's a job that almost always involves being thrown in at the deep end with little time to prepare, having to get used to an unfamiliar car in an era where you can't do any testing ahead of time. Over the years, some drivers have made it work with memorable performances, but this video isn't about them, as the ones that went wrong are much more fun to look back at. And let's all be thankful Nico Hülkenberg got a second shot with Racing Point at Silverstone in 2020, which prevented his non-start in the British Grand Prix getting him onto this list. Before we jump into our 10 choices, remember to hit the subscribe button if you haven't already, to keep up with everything we're doing here at the race and to show your support. We've been truly blown away by how many of you have enjoyed watching our videos so far and there's plenty more to come from this channel. Look, we know it wasn't Button's fault that things went badly when he stood in at McLaren for the 2017 Monaco Grand Prix, but we've chosen to include some drivers whose appearances didn't go well, even if they drove well. It gives us more options to choose from and allows us to include some entries beyond the obvious ones. Unfortunately for Button, through factors outside of his control, he was subjected to a miserable race on the streets of Monte Carlo when he returned so Fernando Alonso could race in the Indy 500. Button made it into Q3 despite having never driven the faster breed of 2017 cars before arriving in Monaco, but he was always doomed to take a grid penalty for engine component changes ahead of the event. He started from the pits and spent the entire race running in last until he eventually made a frustrated attempt to pass the Sauber of Pascal Wehrlein and tip the German onto his side against the barrier. The qualifying performance showed what Button was capable of but McLaren's doomed Honda engine partnership prevented him making good on that in the race. The Ligier JS11 was the car to have at the start of 1979, taking three wins in the first five races with Jacques Lafitte and Patrick Depaillet. When Depaillet was injured in a hang gliding accident, Jackie Ix was called up. Ix was no slouch, having starred earlier in the decade with Ferrari and subsequently at Le Mans, but he'd not raced regularly in F1 since parting ways with Lotus during 1975. He struggled to get on with the fearsome ground effect cars of the late 70s with an average qualifying position of 17th, but he did manage a couple of points finishes thanks to attrition. Marc Genet's fifth place in a one-off appearance for Williams at the 2003 Italian Grand Prix was pretty good, but that's not why he's here. The following season, he was called up again following Ralph Schumacher's big crash at Indianapolis, but after two underwhelming performances in the admittedly difficult walrus-nosed Williams FW26, he was moved aside for fellow test driver Antonio Pizzonia. Pizzonia had the benefit of getting his hands on the conventionally-nosed car for three of his four starts, but even before that car arrived, he'd got the original design into the points as well. Genet's services were no longer required, and he took up a role with Ferrari instead, where he remains to this day. Andre Lotter is best known for his performances in sports cars of Audi, Formula E where he currently races, and the many years he spent racing in Japan. In 2014, he made an unexpected one-off appearance in F1 with Caterham. He treated it as a chance to tick the box of driving in a Grand Prix and managed to out-qualify teammate Marcus Ericsson. But in Lotterer's own words, he didn't even get to work up a sweat before his car suffered a loss of power after just a single lap. Lotterer turned down subsequent offers from Caterham to return, satisfied that he'd scratched his F1 itch. When McLaren's attempts to get Alain Prost for 1994 failed, it signed Martin Brundle. But throughout the selection process and even once the season was up and running, engine supplier Peugeot put pressure on the team to give the seat to Frenchman Philippe Alliot. Brundle and Alliot even went head to head in a test at Paul Ricard, where Alliot appeared to have gone faster until it emerged that he'd mysteriously managed to go through a temporary chicane without lifting off the throttle or applying any steering lock. Alliot got a chance to race against Brundle when Mika Hakkinen was banned for the Hungarian Grand Prix. Brundle started 6th and ran 3rd until the final lap, while Alio qualified nearly a second slower and started 14th. After that, there wasn't quite so much pressure from Peugeot to give him another go. 
Jack Villeneuve walked away from BAR a race early at the end of 2003, then sat on the sidelines during 2004 until he got a surprise call up from Renault. Villeneuve was drafted in when Renault split with Jarno Trulli with three races to go. Flavio Briatore had tried to sign Villeneuve for Benetton in the past, so hopes were high, but he failed to score a point. He managed two 10th places and one 11th, while Fernando Alonso bagged two fourths and a fifth in the other car. Villeneuve said he was happy with his performances and landed a drive with Sauber for 2005 in the process. Prior to the 2005 Malaysian Grand Prix, Anthony Davidson's F1 career featured two appearances for Minardi in 2002 and a season of Friday outings with BAR in 2004. He got a last minute call up to race for BAR in Malaysia when Takuma Sato fell ill. Davidson wasn't getting any Friday running in 2005 so he ended up being thrown in at the deep end on Saturday morning. He qualified 15th, 6 places behind teammate Jensen Button but his race was short lived. Both BARs retired with embarrassing engine failures after just two laps and this was after the team had deliberately retired from the Australian Grand Prix to be allowed to fit fresh engines for the heat of Malaysia. And we thought Honda saved all their hilarious failures for when they came back with McLaren. Talking of which... Kevin Magnussen lost his McLaren drive after one season to make way for Fernando Alonso's return in 2015. Then Alonso suffered a bizarre accident in testing and had to miss the season opener due to a concussion. Magnussen was called up from reserve duties to race in the Australian Grand Prix, but all that meant was he got to experience just how bad the reborn McLaren-Honda partnership was. He completed 33 laps all weekend due to a lack of reliability and a crash in FP2, and to make sure his trip to Australia was utterly pointless, his car broke down before the start of the race. Had Nigel Mansell not contracted chickenpox, McLaren would have won every race in 1988. And had Martin Brundle been available for a second appearance standing in at Monza, McLaren would have won every race in 1988. Instead, Williams called up sports car racer and its occasional test driver Jean-Louis Schlesser for a one-off drive in the Italian Grand Prix. By the time of his call up, Schlesser hadn't driven an F1 car in over a year. He qualified 22nd, two seconds adrift of teammate Riccardo Patrese, and was 11th out of the 13 cars still running when race leader Ayrton Senna came up to lap him for the second time with two laps to go. Schlesser's attempt to get out of the way was certainly clumsy, locking up offline into the first chicane, but it's unfair to blame him entirely for the accident that followed, as Senna's desire to take the racing line required the Williams to vanish. Schlesser was still running at the finish, where he was classified one place behind Senna, even though the McLaren had retired at the scene of the accident. The crash gave Ferrari an emotional 1-2 on home soil following the death of Enzo Ferrari, and Schlesser later admitted he was pleased Senna still won the championship that year, so he couldn't be blamed for costing him the title. In fairness to Luca Badoa, the 2009 Ferrari wasn't a great car, but it also wasn't a last on the grid car and that's where he qualified it on his two appearances filling in for the injured Felipe Massa in a forgettable return to F1 race action after 10 years as a test driver. The Italian wasn't first choice for the drive, with Michael Schumacher initially being tempted out of retirement for a sensational return, until testing in a 2007 car revealed he was still suffering from a motorbike accident earlier in the year. It felt like a fairy tale story for Badoa, who was surprisingly passed over in 1999, when Ferrari chose Mika Salo to replace Schumacher because it didn't want to disrupt his season with Minardi. But the fairy tale quickly turned to a nightmare, and the most memorable moments from Badoa's hopeless return were responding to a warning of traffic after a pit stop in Valencia by pulling over and letting Roman Grosjean through, much to the fury of engineer Rob Smedley, then accidentally tapping the back of Adrian Sutil's Force India when he pulled into Park Ferme. He was ditched for Giancarlo Fisichella, who didn't do much better over the rest of the season, but let's face it, he could hardly do worse. That completes our list. Give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it and head to the comments to tell us who we missed or who should have been number one. And if you'd like to keep up with all of our videos here on YouTube, hit the subscribe button so you never miss out.